So maybe Jan wants to say something else. We are on live now. Ah, okay, okay. So we can continue with the program. Okay, so uh, uh, our next chairman is Pedro, Pedro Ramirez. So Pedro, uh, please continue with the, with the afternoon session. Hey, thank you, Ramon. Uh, thank you very much to, organ to the organizers for all the work involved in the Medinas Fest. It's wonderful to see all these friends. And thank you, you, thank, and thank you for giving me the, the opportunity to, to be the chairman of this second session. So let me start with the introduction of the first speaker. It's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Monica Olvera de la Cruz. She's the lawyer, uh, Taylor Professor of, of Material Science and Engineering. Professor of Chemistry, Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering, Professor of Physics and Astronomy, Director of the Center of Computation and Theory of Soft Materials, and Co-Director of the Center of Bio-Inspired Bio Energy Science. She has developed theoretical models to determine the thermodynamics, statistics, and dynamics of macromolecules in complex environments, including multi-component solutions of heterogeneous synthetic and biological molecules and molecular electrolytes. I want to say that Professor Olvera de la Cruz is a person who has always been willing to collaborate and share with our group. So it's a pleasure that she accompanies us on this special occasion. Please go on with your talk, Monica. Okay, thank you very much. I am so happy to have the opportunity to talk about this, uh, my work, and let me First, uh, I guess I share the screen first, and then um, is this talk? Yeah. And so I go to um, the view. Hold on a second. Oh, I guess. Um, Is that okay? You can see the mode? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to talk about some very uh, a different subject, but when I was listening to the previous talk, I decided I could add some things that are related to what was discussed per, um, the previous session. So anyway, my talk is about controlling soft matter with magnetic fields. And my students that participate in the project are here in, in, in red. Chase Hang and Abeg, and previously was John Denster and a, and a Mexican uh, postdoc I had, Pablo. The experiments are done in the lab of Sam Stoop, and this is a project from the Center of Inspired Energy Science. So very briefly, I am going to say, you know, the magnetic colloids, obviously, you know, they are have been of interest for a, for a long time and are used in many, many different um, fields, you know, from drug delivery and, and even in medicine to just uh, uh, also active matter and so on. So besides coding and catalysis. So I'm going to discuss um, uh, properties associated with these uh, materials, but mixing the, uh, not so much in the liquid state, uh, these colloidal uh, magnetic colors, but coupling to elasticity. And so my group has been working for a long time in um, describing um, elastic media of uh, hydrogels, for example. On the left is it's a peptide amplifier fiber, which is able to contract because it's polymerized with a polymer that is sensitive to temperature becoming poor solvent. So you can align the fibers and be able to contract microscopically these systems with just temperature changes. And uh, on the bottom, I have an example of adding two gels where you push them and they buckle and they form this sort of uh, very special bucklings where you have something that is called perversion, which is a kink in the middle that changes the chirality of how they roll about uh, the defects that are produced in these systems. And on the right, I have an example of multi-component shells where you have two uh, chemical components that can buckle into many different shapes you know, uh, to release the elastic strain. And so I'm gonna show some examples of what happened when you put magnetic particles in some of these systems and you are able to use external fields to actuate uh, matter. For example, here's some, you know, Janus particle with magnetic particles on one side and not in the other with a field that is uh, pulsating and so making them change shape. And in the bottom is, um, 
It's a fiber of ferromagnetic uh, particles in a hydrogel, which um, after light, it gets contracted because it gets hydrophobic. And then with magnetic fields processing or rotating in this case, can be able to be actuated and walk. So these are sort of the topics that I've been, have been interested in. So in the talk, I'm going to uh, get that outline to go and, and discuss these examples of these actuators or robots in first in magnetoelastic filaments and membrane actuators. But I, um, I'm going to add some something of some input of Magdalena in my work that is a little bit of deviation, but, uh, but you might find interesting because it's related to the previous discuss, discussion in some sense. And then I'm going to go back to producing metallastic swimmers and they activate the walkers. So let me just do review for people. There are two types of magnetic systems that we will be discussing. They are the ones that are ferromagnet, that they do have a permanent magnetization, even in the absence of a field. And those systems, you know, we're going to uh, use them to actuate matter, but will be in the linear regime where you just uh, put an external field, but still you don't reverse the magnetization by the field. And the others are super paramagnetic, which are, you know, more at, um, uh, applied for the nanoparticles where they don't have a permanent magnetization, but they, when you put a field, they react instantaneously and align in response to the field, external field. So these are super paramagnets. And so here's some example of what you can do when you put these uh, super paramagnetic particles in different external fields. So if you have a colloidal suspension of them and you put an external field, they will align, you know, the dipoles and you will find sort of lines, you know, like in sort of fluids that they just form lines, you know, of aligned dipoles. But if you start processing the field, say here the external fields start, is it rotating around pi over two, then instead of lines, what you will form is a membrane in 2D. And from the top, you will just look at the membrane looks like that, you know, and, and, and from the side where there's just uh, slides of membranes form. So of course you can do more complicated fields in, in, in even uh, three dimensions and so on. But let me just stick to this simple processing the actual one um, in, in two directions. Uh, but what I'm gonna talk about is when you change this angle of precession around this uh, axis. So, they had been um, used these magnetic filaments, you know, to actuate matter already. And there are some examples here by some uh, authors, you know, where, um, hold on. Um, oh, so to actuate this one, I have to move my machine, sorry about that. And so they have some applications and here, even in a lazy sperma, they had put them to direct them uh, to an egg, you know, uh, or below. So, what we're going to study is how to um, simulate these magnetoelastic filaments first. And I do these filaments because they are simpler to understand. And then I will talk about the membranes. So the filaments, the Hamiltonian will have just in the simulations, we'll have the dipole interactions between the neighbors. And, uh, and then we'll have also bending rigidity of the filaments because they are made of glue of super paramagnetic particles with some gel, you know, that can be deformed. And you just have Langevin uh, heat bath. And so you have, the, remember the magnetic moment you develop in the particles is really proportional to the magnitude of external field, but it has a component external field and therefore the magnetic moment in, of the particles mu is changing with the cosine W T of frequency of the processing field and, and sine theta of the direction of where you are around your processing the, the magnetic field. So if you process very, very fast, you can actually average out so that you can uh, not move the center of mass of the particles by the heat path, but just you know, very fast, you can, you can pre-average this uh, external field and the Hamiltonian becomes very simple and you can um, write it just in terms of a quantity this is three cosine square of theta, the precession. And then this is just the phi angle between the neighbors dipole-dipole interactions. So if you only put nearest neighbors interaction, you can write a very simple Hamiltonian that has the bending part due to the curvature that can develop when you distort the filament. And then a magnetic part that changes sign according to the angle of precession. So there is a critical angle, 54 degrees, for which you change the, this m of theta, which is that component cosine square of theta minus one third, change the sign. So uh, what it means is that if you were to put um, back these filaments, you will have 
if you have a, 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 a direction theta zero, they will align as if they were free particles, but the filaments are aligned. At zero, you just have van der Waals interactions. They are random, the filaments. And at pi over two, like the, um, the sheets that they form, they form these sheets of filaments. So aligned filaments form almost an embryo. And you can actually do math to describe, for example, what will happen if you put a force at the end of these filaments? These are the filaments connected here. And if you put a force, you can see what sort of um, uh, displacements you can uh, create. And the, 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 the first one will be, sorry about this, I have my computer blocking. There is, um, they can produce helixes if you are at an M theta greater than zero, so the critical angle. And if you are less than that critical angle, then they will just buckle on the plane. So you can do off-plane buckling or on-plane buckling. And of course, when you have much stronger uh, buckling or, or compression, you will start deforming these shapes. And this is what we find in the simulations that they form this sort of like uh, flopping. It flops to one side and breaks the symmetry, but that cannot be seen with a simple Hamiltonian that we pre-average. Of course, if you put the, if you hold the, the, in another direction, horizontal, then it's like if you flip the other case and now opposite with theta greater than zero will be the M of theta negative and they will buckle like on the plane, as I show. And so we can define for this system some magnetic modulus, M prime, which is like a force that depends on the parameters of the system and also magnetoelastic parameter that depends on these magnetic mod modulus, the length square of the filament over the bending rigidity cap. And so this is a dimensional parameter, and you can describe the physics of this actuation with these parameters. Now, if you process the field much slower, and so there is going to be um, a torque that develops pushed by the, the heat band balancing the force, you know, magnetic force torque. And so you will create many different structures. For example, here you can wrap around the ends, you know, of the filaments. And these things have been observed recently you know, which is very exciting, you know, all of these um, snails and things that we predicted with this simple model. So what I want to discuss now is, uh, you know, this summarize that we can actually actuate them with very simple forces using processing fields and that uh, you can create uh, either actuation when you hold the ends or if they are free, you can uh, give rise to many conformations. But now we want to do membranes. And so the membranes, they have more complicated buckling, but it's very related to what I show before. You know, um, if you have here a membrane and in these hooks at the ends, you know, and you have fields with a given theta, you can actually distort it and, and, and buckle it. And we make these membranes uh, using functionalized DNA, for example, here, if you have uh, particles that are functionalized with DNA the spheres that have a complementary um, others say the, the blues and the red are complementary, but repulsive blue to blue and red to red, then they can form hyperstructures that you can deform if you have the core of these particles magnetic. And you can also try to make processing the field the flat membranes, you know, that I will be discussing. But here is where I want to mention some work of, of Magdaleno. And the reason for that is because when we were assembling with DNA possible phases like compounds, this is a small particle with a large one and they have complementary uh, DNAs, you can arrange depending on how you mix the particles with different interactions, many different compound structures. You know, you can get the BCC types or LAB2 and so on. And I will not go discuss the physics of that, but just a, a recent development that we made when we were co-assembling particles that were complementary. Red, suppose the red it was be like a positively charged, and this will be as a negatively charged. Okay, so they repel each other, the blue to blue, but they attract the blue to red, and so they form ionic type compounds, right? And so these compounds, you know, have been studied for a long time. And what we find is that when the little one, which is the opposite complementary to the red, becomes very, very small in, in size and number of particles, then it forms like a metallic bonding where the little particles start roaming around, okay? Roaming around and they hold the large particles because these simulations are done at zero pressure. 
So you can see that what is holding it together is this is roaming around particles. And then uh, Magdaleno sent me this paper with the title Ionic and Wigner Glasses, Superionic Conductors and Spinodal Electrostatic Gels, Dynamically Arrested Phases of the Primitive Model, which is a PRL of 2009. This is much, um, is 10 years earlier than our paper that was published in Science, where he actually used this um, the self-consistent general Langevin approach uh, with the primitive model in, in, in electrostatics, okay? So he used oppositely charged particles. And he actually does find a phase where these smaller particles get delocalized when they have um, certain ratios of charges. And so that's what I found very interesting. So, you know, when we were doing these compounds, they, we found that when they were very large and they have a lot of interactions, they form ionic crystals and you could see them, you know, the large particles. But when they weren't very small, you could not see them, but uh, they were moving, they were delocalized you know, in the, the small particles. And then when we did the simulation, if you label them, we saw that they were actually fusely diffusive. Here we only labeled the, the green ones, so you see them, they move around the system and that they hold the lattice. So we tried to understand this, how to characterize this type of, of, of matter, right? That is, uh, you know, it's a colloidal structure. In here, in this case, the electrostatic, the interactions are not electrostatic, they are short range, but they do have a long range interaction through a excluded volume because the small particles have um, grafted chains. You know, in grafted chains, you know, if they were Gaussian, they would be like random walks things, but they have some rigidity to them and they have some exclusion. So there is a net repulsion between the little ones, blue. Uh, beyond the hard core is a hard core dress with these sort of like softer chains uh, interactions that resemble like a Dubai hookal, if you want. And then the large ones also are repelling themselves because they have this, um, by the screwed volume, they have only repulsions, the red to red uh, linkers, right? And they also have conformational changes. So uh, when we work, we said, how do you characterize the system? And we just said, well, let's just calculate the visitation of the small particles in the lattice that they hold. They hold the lattice of the big ones together. And so you can, we said, well, we can characterize that like a Boltzmann um, uh, distribution of probability that they occupy. And we find that indeed, when you have certain ratios of in the mixtures of a small to large, that will be say for a given stoichiometry of the small to large particles. So you have four little ones for one lar large one. Then the way they localize uh, completely. But if you have a fraction that was more like the one where they can be in the interstitials of the compound, like a six to one, and they have a potential interaction more strong by putting eight linkers in the little ones, then they become more um, compounds, ionic lattices. So I was fascinated to see that, that this was reproduced by the the work of Magdaleno and his group. I was trying to move them, but I can't. I get, oh, here it is. So, but what we find interesting is we define something that we call metallicity, which was basically that frequency of visitation, log, log of that um, probability that being certain sites, which is like a Shannon entropy and then normalize per unit self and the number of particles entropy. And it's interesting that these systems, you know, when they form compounds that metallicity, which is the degree of the localization, has a minimum at the compound values. But then they have, um, they act like this um, uh, band structure, if you want, of free electrons, where they have higher metallicity and you're filling up the interstitials, you know, adding more number of particles to large ratio. And then they become a minimum, like in a band, you fill up the band, so the conductivity is decreasing. And then you have more electrons that can go to the conduction band, and then the conductivity again increases, so the metallicity increases. So we find that's what we call it metallicity because we thought it was relation relation to this metallic like bonding. But uh, and uh, you can actually we did some experiments, and indeed you know when you have very few linkers, they are delocalized, and when the small particles have a lot of linkers, they become more compound like. You can make other structures, for example, FCCs, and try to see for a given ratios of a small to large particles. Here is the compound ratio, 10 to 1, when you fill all the interstitial of a compound with the small ones. And what happens if you go to larger values, then they become more localized. So it's, it's, um, it changes you know, how the degree of metallicity will change. And you can do even very complex you know, Frank Casper phases for these structures. 
So, um, you know, again, if you plot that metallicity function, they have the minimum for the one when you fill all the, the interstitials of the compound, 10 to one small to large values. And the Frank Casper also have some new magical numbers that, you know, of phases that have not been predicted uh, yet, but that we found numerically and at a specific ratios of compounds. So this was very interesting. And uh, as I said before, we relate this to some sort of like uh, metallicity and free electrons things filling up bands and fitted for the other structures. And what we find is that when you have uh, the specific ratios, then it's not really a transition, but um, continuously you change the degree of the localization of the small particles if you have the perfect stoichiometry. But if you don't have the stoichiometry, you can generate coexistence of, for example, in a phase of seven to one, where you have some of them in FCC and some of them in BCC, and in the BCC forming compound, but delocalizing the FCC together. And this is something that was also found by the theory of Magdaleno applied in that PRL paper. They have this dynamic mix states in which the ions of high valency becomes localized and the other ones more mobile. And uh, so I was finding fascinating that they were so early to, to actually explain a lot of things on superionics. You know, superionics are materials now that are using for batteries where the small ion in a compound, the, they get the localized one of the ions. And so you can actually be movable and, and it will be very, very, very good for batteries. So I had to mention that because the discussion before was about different theories of glass transition. This is more predicting periodic states with the small ones, but it was also accessed by the theory of Magdaleno. And of course, in that paper, they did find other glassy states too. So, you know, they conclude this is conceptually very interesting prediction of the theory, since it implies the possibility of finite ionic conductivity of the delocalized contained ions to distort the solid matrix of the arrested ionic species. But they also find it periodic, as uh, in the case of superionics. So anyway, and they have this mixed state of solid electrolyte, superionic, and conducting phases. So, um, so I was very happy that I was able to put this into my talk, uh, even though it was supposed to be on the magnetic membranes, which we don't find effect. We actually wanted to make them very ordered magnetic structures. And the core is going to be a magnetic. Uh, so I'm going to go back to the magnetic membranes that I was going to discuss. And uh, so similar to how we do the case of the linear um, magnetic particles glue with an elastic component. Um, but here, for example, if we make them for the DNA, the two um, complementary DNA with core magnetics, you can actually make very strong the linkage so they remain uh, uh, fixed elastically, or you can cross-link them later and form these elastic materials. So if you have the same simulation with the dipole, dipole interactions, uh, and the bending of the whole membrane and the stretching and some van der Waals interactions, you can actually simulate uh, by doing a processing field here, we just horizontally constrain them and can change the length, you know, by um, bearing L, uh, initial L zero, you can actually compress uh, the system a lot and then applying the processing field in this theta direction, you deform it into many different structures. And uh, depending on these, magnetoelastic parameter gamma. In this case, the gamma has included the, the cosine squared theta term, so it can be positive or negative. And um, so when we do this, we sort of recover a phase diagram of, of possible bucklings of membranes. And so what I want you to, to see in here is that it's very different depending on the angle of precession that you pick in its structure, and also the magnitude of this uh, processing field. And so if you go to very large um, magnitudes, you can get very strained uh, structures that are going to be useful later on for swimming of memories I'm going to show you in restricted environments. And the restricted environments, um, so this is just processing like that. And if you, be, if you change the angle theta, you can also get very different um, buckling transitions and hysteresis in how, you know, it relax the system when you um, uh, check, turn off the fields. So this is going to be of interest when we want to buckle uh, nanocompartments, you know, uh, which are 
elastic shells, you know, that are big, we have been studied for a long time because they can be used to as catalytic structures. And when you have no magnetic particles on it, uh, you can discretize these sort of elastic shells, like will be like a vesicle or it can be like a virus, say, but it's more elastic or some uh, micro compartments that are fine in, in bacteria. So they are closed shells. And if you triangulate these with um, uh, uh, vertices and uh, study how these uh, materials behave, if you have uh, magnetic particles, if you don't have magnetic particles, it's known to buckle itself to release a strain because these systems have defects. When you, when you try to wrap an sphere, you're gonna have defects. And the defects are pentamers as opposed to hexamers. And these pentamers, they have a minimum 12 of them. So when you have 12 defects in a sphere, localized in a sphere, and they are going to buckle to release the strain, they do it simultaneously and form an icosahedron. So that's a very, very um, ubiquitous shape of closed shells. So when you put magnetic particles in the vertices of these buckle structures, you can change completely the type of phase diagram that you can create. Um, this will be the magnetic particles. And now uh, so without magnetic particles, you have all of these terms and you relax it and it can create this icosahedra. Once you have a maximum number gamma of elastic modulus over the size of the sphere, uh, times the size of the sphere square and the bending of it, when it increases to a value greater than 150, you should buckle it. So that's how this material buckles into icosahedra with these vertices coming out simultaneously. So now we, we put in it the magnetic particles, then we add in the Hamiltonian, the magnetic Hamiltonian. And here with a constant uh, external field, you can change that in here if you add this magnetoelastic parameter, which is the magnetic moment, moment M that I described before, the square of the size and the bending rigidity, and when you increase here, the other parameter, which is the von van Karman number, which is proportional to the young modulus, the size of square over kappa, you can change the buckling that in the case with the magnet to very, very different shapes. Uh, uh, and this is something that we would like to explore by making, um, uh, uh, by studying what would happen if you now process the field into these uh, magnetic structures. So you can actually uh, make them, you know, change shapes and uh, they don't swim in this case because you need hydrodynamics and you need to break symmetries to make them swim. So to make the swimmers, we have to make either janos of these particles or even in the flat case that I show you before of the membranes that we make, the quassemble membranes, if you let them free, you have to break the symmetry uh, of the structure of the membrane. And so this is what uh, we had explored. And so in the membrane case, the, the colors here is just how they are changing the X, Y plane when they go inside out, they wobble like this. So when you still don't put hydrodynamics, you, you cannot let them swim. You have to also to include hydrodynamics. And this is because these are the nanoscale materials. So at low Reynolds number, when you have small particles, you have to, uh, you don't have to, um, you don't have inertia uh, very strong to make you swim. Like if you have, you know, when you go to swim, you know, you produce this turbulent flow and just making this motion back and forth that allows you to swim. For organisms that are very small, it's not possible. And you have to have, you know, uh, closed loops where you swim, but they can go in the, they can, the closed loops cannot be, you know, in the same direction. You have to deform one side go back and deform the other side to go back in the cyclic swimming. So for the membranes now that if we want to make them swim, suppose we have a, sorry here, the, uh, the spherical one and we have processing fields, depending on the frequency, you can't make the, the wobbling on the, the, the formation on the system. In this case, you have a heat bath, just the lunge band, you know, and uh, you can make a phase diagram of the regions where you have different type of wobbling of the, um, the structure. You can have very strong, and then you can make them deform very, very uh, differently. 
than just wobbling and even, you know, uh, make them sort of like, um, how do you call this one? Uh, I don't forgot how we call them. But, uh, but, you know, they change the shape, they deform in very different ways, depending on the frequency you choose and the precession angle of the external field. So um, here, there are these dancers, we call them dancers, you know, they have different, depending on the regions where we are, gobl uh, gobblers that just do this. And at the end, there are the quasi-static case where it's so fast the precession, this is the precession frequency, and this is the precession angle, that you just go back to the quasi-static state that I showed before that you can just pre-average the field. And here, you know, the torques are important in this other region. So we can use this to actually produce the swimming. And so in a, there is a critical transition where you go from the wobblers to dancer. And so if you are very close to this critical transition above, you know, you have the fr critical frequency and at time, the potential energy is flat. But if you are below, you actually can produce these oscillations, you know. So it's a very different, it's like a, like a phase transition in the, in the type of motion that you can produce. So uh, if you want to make and study the swimming of this, you have to include hydrodynamics. And we do that via the lattice Boltzmann fluid and just calculate how the fields develop, the flow around this uh, wobbling uh, structure. And so it still, it won't swim if you have it symmetric, the structure, but if you cut it, and let's just call it here H, so you break the symmetry of these um, membranes, then you can actually produce this uh, sort of um, displacement of the center of mass. And here it is how you display the center of mass, you know, and the, and the path you follow for the case of the cut membrane uh, when you break the symmetry. So if you want to make it swim in a straight line, you have to design the fields that uh, will allow you to, to go into a, a, a speed that swings vertically, okay? So you have to make sort of changes of direction of the external field to arrange for that. So this is like, a, you know, the example of swimmers for a, for a flat one. And as I told you in the beginning, we can um, expand this, you know, first, we just show that you can actually induce fields with waves alone, it's traveling waves. And when you put hydrodynamics and uh, uh, break the symmetry, you can achieve, you know, uh, the motion of translation of the motion of these membranes uh, at the nanoscale. So there are many models for swimming. Okay. And so there are some very interesting that they have a material inside and it's not the tail, but the deformation of the material inside that causes the swimming. And so we would like to, to generate these um, shells that I show you that they buckle when they are homogeneous and they buckle into different shapes when you put an, an external field. But now in order to make them swim, we have to break the symmetry. And so instead of just using an homogeneous shells, you can choose one that has different mechanical properties than the other parts, the blue and the red, and you put the magnetic particles in the red or the blue. And so this is with the Langevin, you know, I show you that you could just as, um, actuate it like that, but it's not swimming, it's just, um, it has a, like the scallop, it just open up back and forth and it's not displaced in the center of mass. To, to be able to, to swim, you have to include hydrodynamics. And there are some experiments where you can see that you have, can produce motion if you have, uh, you contract and relax at a different rate. So you have to break the symmetry of contraction and relaxation. And so you can do that with these membranes. Uh, let's see. Hmm. Yes. Uh, if you have one part, you know, um, with magnetic particles and the other one without. And so this is the fields. You have um, fields in X and Y direction. And so you can make the center of mass translate. So this is some example, you know, how to generate the swimming. And uh, we have been trying to, to get more complicated swimming patterns, and then you will have to use different bucklings. I remember I told you when you have constrained the ends, depending how you put the field, the flat membrane can, when it's uh, constrained at the ends, can deform and do bucklings into different shapes. So here is just exploring those type of buckling with the Janus particle, because the more rigid um, particles on the one side are holding the other one. 
So this just shows an example of how you can make with these magneto elastic materials, you know, this sort of um, uh, coupling the elasticity with the magnetics, you can construct you know, these artificial swimmers. The last example I'm going to show, um, it's, uh, I have to finish soon, I'm sorry. This is for the ferromagnetic ones. And so here we just make, uh, people have used elastomers to put magnetic particles inside that you deform with an external field and make them, you know, actuate them. But uh, what we use um, are, are two fields, you know, the external field is, it's actually in this case is, is processing at pi degree or rotating. And so we use, instead of um, super paramagnetic particles, we use uh, hydrogel where you uh, make a, a line, you have aligned fibers inside that are ferromagnetic and you can use light to actually actuate this because the gel is a hydrogel that has some material that when you shed light, it becomes hydrophobic and it wants to contract. So you shed the light from the bottom and it wants to contract. Uh, and so when it contracts, you know, it can pick up an object. And uh, if you continue shedding the light, you know, it can close itself and start rolling uh, around with the, with the particles and so on. So you can produce a lot of motion and release the cargo and, you know, and deliver it and so on. So you can make these sort of um, materials. That are, here, the length scale is three millimeters. So they are not at the nano scale or micro, but uh, they are swimming by a different, they are walking by a different mechanism. And um, so this is the way you, you align the fibers first, then you polymerize the gel and so now they are aligned and you put inside the gel some um, chloroforms that are hydrophilic if they are in the, in the dark. And when you put the light, become hydrophobic. So there's a chemical reaction where they get excited and, and decay, you know, in time. And so you can actually see how much light absorbs. And when the light is absorbing, you change the gradient of water in the system and this absorption of them in the gel. So with that, um, you can add the elasticity of the gel in the model, you know, and the water produces a poor solvent, like a regular solution model in the gel. And when you add elasticity to these uh, components of the gel, you can make it contract identically to what they occurs in the experiments. And the amount of light, of course, if you put a lot, a lot of light and, um, is very strong, it can absorb all and it goes back to flat. So you have to calculate how much the bending you want to produce. Once you have the bending, it's very simple because you know that the magnetic ferromagnets are aligned in the direction, this direction. And so when you put the field, when the field is in the direction, external field is here, these um, want to align along the field of ferromagnetic fibers. So they want to stretch and open up the legs of the contracted gel. And when you reverse the field, so they remember that you are going to process the field, when you are in the other direction, then these, they want to align into the field. So these ones wants to rotate back and uh, go back to align in the field, external field. So what that produces is, um, it's, uh, this is the magnetization and, and the torque that it produces in the system. And so when you're processing the field, which is the arrow that is moving, you are uh, allowing this material, if you put contact, like no sliding, to walk. So this is how we produce these walkers. And, um, you know, it, it reproduced very, very uh, uh, well, the experiments. So when you put the non-slippery motion, then it starts walking. As I told you before, we're just staying in the region of the magnetic response linear of the ferrofagnes to the external field. So it's very small external fields. It's 160 Gauss or 16 uh, megatesla and many teslas. And so here is, if you want to make a turn, then you have to calculate the torques and it's a little bit more complicated than uh, that simply the case of walking. And you have to calculate the torques and how you change the field to make it rotate and, and uh, align. And finally, this is, uh, sorry, I think I have to stop now. And this is a case of, you can design the paths of the robot. In the computer, you can say, what are the torques and all the fields and so on you need to make it go a particular path. And on the right-hand side is experiment. So we program the magnetic field 
with a particular, you know, uh, hydrogel and it has been already put in light and contract and make it, you know, follow the same path that we design. So for people in soft mana, this is pretty amazing, right? Because you can see that it does actually reproduce exactly what the robot is doing. So, you know, many of these um, models we have are, are just very classical things. And so the point of this is that you can use them very reliable to, to produce these robotic uh, functions and so on. So I hope I have shown you some examples of how you can actuate soft matter with external magnetic field. And um, I want to just... Oh, here. Excuse me? So I think it's, it's not a, a question or, or anything. No, okay, there was somebody talking. Oh. Okay, so I just want to, to conclude, you know, that um, thank my group that did all the work and uh, Conclude that, you know, I hope I have uh, convinced you that there is sort of a, a lot of problems that we can't, you know, study for inactive matter now uh, using soft materials and external fields, either, you know, with light and combined light, hydrodynamics and elasticity with magnetic uh, functions. Okay, well, thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Monica, for this nice talk. And we have time for some questions. Someone, do you want to? And stop sharing. Yeah. Um, can I? Esteban also has one. Anyway, go ahead, Magdaleno. Uh, uh, okay, just basically to, to thank you, Monica, for such a. Yeah, I always feel so astonished about all this incredible beautiful things that you can do both let's say in simulations and and so on and 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 first of all it's a great pleasure to see you you know that uh, we don't talk or write each other very frequently but we are i always have you in my mind and, and all the work that that you do um and and with respect to your mention about the the the, the work uh, of the of the primitive model and applying the theory that 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 is something that we still uh, haven't done what we really meant to do. And, and, and Pedro has, has done a really nice work of doing simulations and checking that some of these uh, double glasses, by the way, the, what you mentioned is the, the, the <laughs> double glass, but now with charged particles. And, and just wanted to say that this, I, I really look forward to, to retake that work and and to collaborate with you in that at some point. I was, I was so happy when you uh, sent me that email with the paper. I didn't know about that work in 2009. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, this is really very related to what we were doing. And then I hired your student, Leticia, to, to come and work with us on this. I mean, we're trying to see, you know, um, how does it resemble to some atomic system, this phenomenon from colors to there? But we're also doing the primitive model. And it's pretty tricky. You have to do equal chemical potential of particles and you have salt in the colloidal case. So it's, uh, we have three components, you know, and, and the stoichiometry changes. So, but it's been a lot of fun to, to work on it. I was very, very impressed with uh, how the theory reproduced many of these yeah. things. And, 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 and of course, I, 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 one would like to do many things, but we are working with, with uh, particles that interact with bipolar potential. It's mostly Luis Elizondo who is working on that and, and, and the postdoc. At some point it would be, in, of course, these are much more elementary kind of models compared to what you showed. But anyway, just wanted to say that I enjoyed And I'm it. sorry, I changed the talk halfway when everybody was talking in the morning. I was adding all that part, you know, in. And so it became too long and, and too much, but I said I had to talk about it. No, so no. I apologize for the people, but it was important for me to include it. Okay, anyway, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to see you. Stefan, do, do you have a question? Yeah, actually a question uh, whether I got this right, followed by, by a question, to be, be honest. Thank you very much for a very inspiring talk. So the last part you showed, if I got this right, this is essentially a flat hydrogel, and then you illuminate it from one side, you get a different distribution of the solvent, and this curves um, your sheet, and then due to the magnetic field, it starts walking. 
does this imply if you would because the important thing if i get this right is having the gradient of uh, water in your kind of bar does this imply if you would have um say a concentration gradient of i don't know water ethanol or something like this that it would actually move in one direction so that this could do chemotaxis because then you essentially have a similar effect of having different water concentrations on the both sides and then with the magnetic field you could do chemotaxis is this right you are, you or temperature right. gradients or whatever yeah that's exactly the point you have to break the symmetry in some way so if they are in a flow of something changing and uh, for example, even temperature. So they, they, they can be a gradient of temperature because they can be hydrophobic if you don't put the light. Um, yeah. You can make them swim against a light. And okay. we are now make them swim, but for that you have to put hydrodynamics with the fields and so on. Yeah. And um, some stupids doing a lot um, to make them in water, you know, with uh, adding things that can absorb more water and then dehydrate. Okay, which means there's in that sense nothing special about the light as long as you get the effect of getting different concentrations. You have to get the gradient of yeah. different in, inside the material. Right, because this is the restoring part. And so when okay. you make it swim, you want it to, you know, use the field to want to open it and then close, you know, and produce a flow of the water. And here was the stepping, the non slippery. Of course, you cannot walk in ice. So you have yeah. to. And yeah. boundary condition in special cases, yes, but you need a gradient uh, there. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, anyone else? Uh, okay, if not, uh, let me close this session. Thank you very much, Monica, for this interesting talk. It's, it's wonderful, really. And and let let us uh, finish this uh, this session, and we.